Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present uh, the topic of human activity recognition and I'm Debaditya Roy. I'm a PhD fellow at KTH and CAMCOM and working with the RACE project. So this is essentially the topic of my research and uh, but I'm going to try, try to present it in a way that makes sense for uh, like not very high end researchers but also to a uh, bachelor's or master's student who are uh, recently delving into the field of machine learning and deep learning. So the way I'm going to present this topic is that it is a multivariate time series classification problem. And uh, with that being said, let me introduce the agenda of our talk so that it gets more clear on how we are going to uh, look at this topic. So we'll start with presenting what exact what is exactly a classification task. Uh, probably you guys already have an idea about what a classification task is, but still I'm going to present it in a way that makes it more sense that makes more sense for this topic. Then I'm going to specifically go into the uh, nuances of time series classification that will give us an idea on uh, how exactly this classification problem can be translated to a time series classification problem or what are exactly the peculiarities about a uh, time series classification. And then we'll talk again about how a generic classification task is executed, what kind of input data we have for this uh, classification task with of course a focus on what exactly do we need to do to make it uh, compatible for a time series classification problem. All that being said, we'll then finally drop into the topic of human activity recognition and how it is a time series classification problem. And then uh, with, the, with some basic introduction to the topic and some uh, relative ideas on this particular uh, issue, we will go into the solutions that are currently out there uh, I will I'll be a bit specific, I'll say machine learning and deep learning solutions that are out there for human activity recognition. And finally, I'll talk about the evaluation. So the whole uh, talk is designed to give you an overview of human activity recognition so that you can uh, make some decisions for yourself on what are the possible research areas that you can concentrate on. Of course, I'm going to provide some pointers for that, but um, we'll talk about what generally is the whole topic about so that you can devise some research areas or some uh, practical problem areas for human activity recognition that will be interesting for you as an engineer, as a researcher or probably a, even as a bachelor or a master student. So with that being said, let me start with what exactly is a classification task. So when we say about classification task, of course, like the, the, the word itself has classification in it. So we need to classify some stuff against some other stuff. And the goal of this uh, task is such as that given some sort of input data, we have to assign that input data to a set of classes. So for example, if we have been given uh, like, you know, temperature, humidity, cloud cover as an input data, what we want to classify could be, for example, whether it's raining or not raining. And since there are essentially two classes, raining and not raining, this type of problems are called binary classification problem. Then we can also have classification problem with images. And for images, what is our input data? It's simply like the pixel of the images that we have. So as you know, the image is a representation in a matrix format and each of the each entry in the matrix represent a particular pixel for that image. And hence, this is the raw data that we receive for an image. And what is our goal? By looking at the pixels, we have to classify this image or assign this image between a group of animals, for example, cats, dogs, horses, etc. So the whole point of the classification task is to put a particular image in any one of the classes. Uh, of course, it can belong to multiple classes together, but we are not going to talk about uh, that in detail. Uh, so what, what the, the gist of this particular slide is to show you that for a particular given, given a input data, we can have a, uh, we can assign that input data to a set of classes so that we can understand uh, what, what exactly this input, where exactly this input data belongs. And that is the goal of a classification task, to classify it among a set of different uh, like entities, classes, groups, or whatever you want to call it. And now, once I have introduced or defined a general classification task, I will talk uh, into a bit detail about what exactly is a time series classification. And for knowing that, we have to understand what exactly is a time series data. Simply stating, any particular data that can be varied with time is a time series data. So one property of a time series data is that it is kind of non-constant for a particular instance of time. So let's say you are at point t equals to zero and there is a certain value for any data that you can imagine at that particular point of time. At t equals to one, you will receive 
another reading for that data. It might be, of course, same with the previous data. It might be different. It might be extremely different. It might be, uh, let's say, very big or very small. But the whole whole point of this, uh, like you know, uh, sentence is the fact that you will receive a reading, and you will treat the reading at time t equals to zero, and the time t at the reading received at time t equals to one as two separate entities. And hence, if you think of the number line, your data varies from the left hand side of the number line to the right hand side of the number line. So what could be the examples of uh, certain time series data? Uh, let's say if we uh, look at a weather station, then a, what, what a weather station receives is uh, hourly temperature. So at, at, at 9 a.m. your temperature was uh, like 12 degrees Celsius and then at uh, maybe at 10 a.m. the temperature is uh, 15 degrees Celsius and so on. So every uh, recording of the temperature for that one hour interval is what we call a time series data and we can have this recording over uh, days months year and then we can again have another uh, subgroup or let's say not subgroup but rather a super group of how the temperature looks in one particular day let's say the average temperature the average temperature of, of today is uh, 25 degrees celsius the average temperature of tomorrow is 30 degrees celsius and we can look at this particular granularity of the data over a month or so so this is one example. The other example could be for uh, you can think of like st stock market prices, which is actually a very good uh, like you know problem for our time series uh, people. Like this is a very popular problem, as you already might have known, or you can actually look up the internet and uh, search for time series problems, and this one will surely come up. Uh, so, for example, if you have uh, varying stock market prices for different stocks over months, years, hours, even day, so you can do different sort of trading. For hour, you can do like intraday trading. Between days, you can do intraday trading. Over months, it will be like you know a medium term investment, and over years, it's actually a long term investment. So, this particular uh, data helps us to do certain analysis on the stock market prices, which is something very central to a time series uh, like you know problem any sort of time series problem i'm not really saying classification at this point of time because you can have a uh, classification problem with the stock market data even some sort of regression problem or simple time series analysis so uh, but yeah we'll come to the classification soon enough and then we can think of another uh, sort of data imagine like uh, the variable devices that you use you let's say you have a smartwatch a smartphone or even a smart belt for doing different sort of exercise and this uh, what this particular devices provide is a stream of sensor data let's what what your uh, like your in your your smartwatch you have a probably you have an accelerometer and a gyroscope i think most of the smartwatches have that so essentially uh, you are constantly at a certain frequency you are receiving a stream of uh, that like you know sensor data coming from the accelerometer device over milliseconds seconds minutes or hours etc so essentially these are examples of certain time series data now there is an interesting observation that i want to draw your attention to which will be uh, kind of useful in in the in the future for the human activity recognition part that we are we will discuss so for example the hourly temperature over the dates that usually is recorded over the hour and and this is very specific to the problem i mean we can of course record a temperature of a weather station at the level of millisecond but do you think that makes a lot of sense? I mean, what's what's the point or what's the fact of knowing a temperature, uh, let's say, at a particular uh, millisecond and knowing the knowing again another temperature in the next millisecond? Probably this uh, sort of change is not very dynamic and the temperature will not change in the granularity of milliseconds. However, if you look at stock prices, you can have a lot of different configurations. Then again, like maybe uh, the milliseconds doesn't make sense, but hourly data daily data monthly data and yearly data for stock market makes a lot of sense but coming to the sensor data you can have actually the data look recorded in the level of milliseconds seconds minutes or hours so what i wanted to draw attention is to the fact that this data has a different granularity of time on how it is being recorded and this record like the, this recorded data over a varying granularity of time also helps us uh, understand or use this data more effectively if we are using like you know uh, streaming the sensor data in interval of days then we cannot do any useful stuff with that maybe we can do some useful stuff but most of the uh, recognition tasks that this particular data used for for the stream of sensor data it will not make a lot of sense if it is recorded in the granularities of day so that being said we have already 
talked a lot about time series data and then now I want to draw your attention to some very basic examples of classification or what we can do with the data. So for example based on uh, like the data coming from stock well, the stock value is coming from uh, different stocks that we have in the stock market we can classify a stock quality so for example you i can give you uh, the stock price for apple google and many other uh, like you know companies and you can based on the based on their monthly value you can actually classify them into three classes let's say good medium and bad and you can this is essentially a classification task that you can have in the stock market Similarly for uh, human activity um, recognition task, what we can do is actually we can use the data coming from the accelerometer device of your smartphone smart much and classify it into a range of human activities and what exactly are those activities it can be running, walking, jogging, even like you know very static activities such as drinking coffee, sleeping, eating etc. So you can do a range of different stuff with the data that are coming from these uh, devices and uh, mind one particular thing that this need not be an accelerometer device. It can be an accelerometer device, a gyroscope device, a magnetometer, and for that matter also even image or video because if you think of a video, it's essentially a transition of frames over the time. So that for a particular uh, problem, this video can be treated as a time series data as well. So essentially, instead of accelerometer device, what we'll have is a frame and that frame consists of image which essentially is the pixel if you remember the slide that I showed you earlier. So that's how we can classify uh, human activity even from uh, looking at the videos which is a time series data in itself. Now I've talked about time series data and uh, like general data just to make an understanding or, an, uh, or, a, or a particular notion about how uh, uh, input to a data occurs and now that being said I will introduce of how exactly a classification task is executed or what we have for a classification task to be executed. Now imagine uh, like you know a mathematical function. So what you have in a mathematical function is a set of input or one input or set of inputs or whatever you can think of and then that you pass into the function and you get a set of output or single output or however you want to call it. And this essentially gives us uh, uh, like you know this essentially gives us how the whole uh, picture looks like and in a similar way we can think that, uh, that a classification task is essentially an input to a mathematical function and that particular mathematical function gives you an output or a range of output and what exactly are those output is the class to which your input belongs and that is simply represented here as input x in the function f and the output effects. So in, if I ask you to design a classification task, what exactly is your goal? Your goal is to, is to define or find this function f in some way or other so that you can feed it with some data and you can get some output at cert, uh, you can get certain output out of this particular function or model or box or whatever you want to call it. And how we are treating that function? For our problem, we are treating that function as certain machine learning systems. And what is the goal of machine learning system? The goal of the machine learning system is to learn a mapping function or the one I was saying before between the input and a corresponding output. So how it works is that we have been given a certain input value and we already know a certain output value against that input and this particular input and output value that we already know from beforehand is what we call a training data. So imagine this particular scenario. You have been given a data set and when we say a data set what exactly do we mean is what we have recorded historically and when you are thinking about machine learning systems you also have to make sure that you know the answers of the questions that you are asking. Because by looking at the questions and the answers together, the machine learning system is going to learn this mapping function. So this is essentially like a back calculation. I mean, I don't know, like at certain point of time, maybe you have encountered in mathematics that you have been given a particular question and you know the answer to that question, but maybe it's, it's kind of like it, it might get a very hard to derive the, the, the answer to from the question directly. So what we do for is for fast calculation, we look at the answer and we kind of back calculate the 
the, the, the solution in between and the solution is what we call the mapping function in machine learning. And so this is exactly how a machine learning system learns. We have been given an input and we know the answers to the question and based on the output and the input it learns a mapping function which gives us uh, like you know your, our solution. But wait, there is a catch because you, you can already ask that what, how are, how are we sure that we know the questions and answers of everything? Of course, you don't know the questions and answers to everything. So based on the training data, you try to find out this mapping function. And once you have found out this mapping function, you use it on unseen data. That is data which is going to come in the future. And with a certain guarantee that this particular function is going to operate uh, in a very elegant way as it was doing the, during the training. So that's your goal. You want to find this mapping function given some sort of input and, and output. And this input and output set is what we call uh, training data. And what exactly we do is we iterate. Uh, so given a we, and, and while training, we do not give it like one single example. We try to be as valid as possible. We try to and like, you know, give it uh, like, you know, as many, um, let's say, distributions as possible so that it can learn from uh, a range of different, uh, like, you know, um, mapping function. So that's the goal. You can imagine like, you know, a child learning, a uh, learning to walking. So the child tries to walk and then as the child fa falls down, the child understands that this is uh, like not the right way. And then uh, he or she tries to uh, like reiterate the process. And that is exactly how a machine learning system works. So you have been given an example and the answer to the example. So the system takes in the input and the output and it tries to learn a mapping function between that. And once it has seen that example, we have we give it another example, then based on the new input, it tries to modify this mapping function again so that it gets like, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it learns a very good mapping function with a holistic uh, understanding of the whole process for which it is trying to learn the function. And uh, for for this machine learning algorithm, uh, we can use uh, like, you know, uh, a lot of different schemes and an optimization on how it uh, like, you know, learn from examples, but we'll not go into that. Uh, but there are some standard, very standard machine learning algorithms that we can use, uh, you know, in a, in a setup like this. So you can you can find a lot of literature. It's a very well researched field uh, with very nice articles out there and uh, in, in the books and stuff. So these are, for example, logistic regression, uh, SVM, random forest, which you might already have heard of, heard about those. And there are also certain, uh, like deep learning is essentially a particular field. Sorry, just have to pause now. Yeah, coming back to everywhere. So deep learning is essentially a field of machine. Uh, you can say it is a subfield of machine learning in a way where uh, the, the way we process this, uh, the way we learn this function, the way we process the inputs and the outputs are, are, but a bit different from uh, like, you know, the standard machine learning algorithms. I would not be exactly or perfectly right when I say it's different because uh, how this particular logistic regression learns is also very different from how an SVM learns and how random forest learns. So I kind of uh, exactly do not guarantee the sentence that I just said before, but essentially deep learning algorithms are uh, different uh, from uh, like this particular algorithms in a certain way. But still you can think, you can treat all of this as algorithms which help us learn this particular mapping function between the input and the output. And this is, uh, mind you, I have not probably said before, but I must uh, clarify that this is not really specific to time series data. This is true for any type of data that you can have in a machine learning or a deep learning system. So the whole, uh, the, the gist of this slide is that we can actually learn this mapping function when we've been given an input and output set together. And that's what we call a training data. And to do that, we have several optimization functions, which essentially are these machine learning, uh, like, you know, algorithms boxed with. So, such as log logistic regression, SVM, random forest. And there is a classification uh, between machine learning and deep learning as it is done by the standard community. And there are deep learning algorithms involving uh, artificial neural network, CNN, convolution neural network and RNNs. Now, I will, if, 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 there, if anyone thinks that I'm not really entirely correct, uh, when I specific say that deep learning, artificial neural network is exactly a deep learning, I agree with you at this point of time. There is uh, like, you know, it's not exactly a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, specific thing that uh, like, you know, I'm trying to uh, discuss, but just bear with me on this fact that we treat them as deep learning algorithms and this as machine learning algorithms so that 
it's it's kind of digestible for uh, everyone out there who has this understanding but this is not what we are discussing or arguing about so let's move on to the next slide now uh, what happens is this input but this particular input data that we are talking about we can think this input data as a set of features that helps us making a decision on the prediction problem now as i was saying when you're talking about a weather uh, prediction problem such as whether it's raining or not you can intuitively think in your mind that uh, the temperature the humidity the wind and the other factors helps a, a meteorologist decide whether it will rain or not similarly if you translate that particular problem into a machine learning system then you kind of uh, like you know assist the meteorologist with that particular machine learning system and the same input that you provide to the meteorologist you have to kind of give that input to the machine learning system in itself and so that's why I call like think of the input as a set of features that helps make a decision on the prediction problem. For example, in a housing price predictor, the number of rooms, the location, the size of the house, these are important factors for image classification problem. As I was as I have specified before, the pixels of the image are the raw data and that helps kind of helps you making the decision on whether it's a cat image or a dog image because at a pixel level, there is certain difference between a cat and a dog that helps the machine learning system as a person like you know as same with as with a person it helps the machine learning system also identify the the difference it's just this as in my head this is automatically wired because that's how i've learned and that is exactly what i have to do with the machine learning system i have to make it understand or learn just by looking at the picture that okay this is a cat and this is a dog so what exactly is an input for a time series problem because as you can imagine uh the set of features uh, is kind of intuitive when you're talking about a classification problem but how exactly do we define that for our time series problem that's a important question that we want to answer and how i want to show you before before showing you this particular slide i must also specify one thing so when i when i talk about a set of features how does the set of features look like the set of features is essentially let's say for for a weather data for uh, ima imagine the housing price predictor problem so as i've said the number of rooms the location and the size of the house are the input features and what you have against this are different type of data so for one particular house the number of rooms is three for one particular house uh, like the number of rooms is four and it has a different location and size and etc so in this way for a lot of different type of houses you have these features and that is essentially a matrix right because you have the columns as number of rooms location and size and then uh, and the rows as the the entries for let's say house one house two house three up till house i don't know like n which can be a million or i don't know like thousands or something like that so basically you can think of this particular uh, like you know setup as a matrix um, of input features and the data so and, and, and how do we do that for a time series problem? Let's just have a quick look. So what exactly does IMT's problem? For As I've specified before, for a time series problem, you have recordings over uh, like, you know, over varying time. So imagine this axis is the time axis. And then what you have is different recordings, different raw accelerometer recordings. I'm saying this is accelerometer, but you can think of it as a stock price as well, like, you know, rise and fall of the stock prices and stuff like that. So essentially but the, but the central point being that each of these particular points are certain recordings that help you and and that is easy, that that is your raw data so if i think this is an accelerometer data let's say this is uh, the recording a1 then we have a2 a3 a4 and so on coming from this raw uh, like you know trans uh, time series data and as i've said before we kind of know the answer so the output to the question and mind you we are talking about a uh, classification task now but it can also be true for regression so basically against each of these points we have a recording or an answer right as i've said because these are raw data so when you're thinking about a house price prediction problem you have let's say a set of data in here and an answer against that set of data so the the number of rooms the the, the location of the house etc and then you have an answer as in the let's say whether the house is a nice house or not good bad or like you know not good something like that so the three class classification problem for the house and then against each of these points for a house let's say which is three-dimensional data given the particular uh, like you know previous slide you have an answer similarly for our accelerometer data as well you have 
individual accelerometer points these are mine these are like single points not a set of points and you have an answer to each of the points there can also of course be a question whether uh, like you know answer for each of the accelerometer points makes sense as it makes sense for a housing price predictor uh, with like you know a set of features that's that's a, that's a good question and maybe it does not make a lot of sense if we have it in the millisecond right because basically your classification task is devised in a way that you can answer a particular question so what's the question for a housing price predictor the question for the housing price predictor is that if i give you the price the location and the number of uh, like the size of the house can you tell me whether it's a good house a bad house or not so good house so this is a central question now imagine like you have a scenario where you record a lot of accelerometer points at particular milliseconds then the central question you should try to ask is if i give you an accelerometer and and let's just imagine that these levels are like you know running walking etc like we are coming to the human activity recognition part slowly now the central question that you should ask is if i like you know give you accelerometer point at the 50th millisecond does it make sense for you to answer a question what exactly were you doing in the 50th millisecond does this particular answer has any relevance to a practical uh, like you know scenario well it might have relevance to a practical scenario but just hold on and think about this what if i ask you what were you doing over the last second instead of asking you what exactly were you doing at the 50th millisecond so in most of the practical applications the granularity of time when it's like in a seconds for human activity recognition task it makes more sense because i might take some decisions based on the fact that you were running on the last second but if i know like you know you were running in the 50th millisecond then probably i also can safely assume you were running in 51st millisecond but if i know that you were running in first second you might certainly stop in the second second which is practically possible so so basically that is what we are trying to design we are trying to design or devise the data set in a way that it can answer certain interesting questions and that's how we are going to process this input or ingest this input time series data and process it in a way that it can be made capable of answering some practical questions which are important for your application so what we do essentially is we take a particular window of time if these are in the granularity of let's say milliseconds i mean depending of course depending on your problem you select a particular range of interval t and this range helps you uh, think about this range as uh, how you want to answer your question if you want to answer your question in let's say uh, seconds then this t if and this granularity is milliseconds then you have to select this t such that it represent like you know a second of your time or something like that and if it's like you know i don't know like 50 milliseconds then probably you have to take 50 points from here and so on so what we do essentially is we take this particular interval of time and then we take all the recordings in that particular interval of time and we translate it is it as a row of matrix and then what we do is we take and this is a standard practice it can be uh, like you know for for your particular case it can be different as well so we take the most occurring levels in this interval of t so let's say this most occurring level here is l1 so es essentially against a1 a2 a3 which let's say t equals to 3 we have the level l1 and then we slide this particular window t over uh, like you know to the to the next set and we continue doing this process until we reach an reach an end to the data and by doing this process what we get is a like you know multiple rows with like you know different like column values and against each of them a level so now you can actually drop that a little bit in what i was saying before right so this essentially is a matrix and level formulation that we are seeing in most of the classification problems that we uh, were, were discussing earlier and this is kind of uh, a raw and ready data that you can feed to some sort of modeling system to find your mapping function that we were discussing and you can of course treat this model can be like any sort of function it can be a machine learning function it can be a statistical function even some very basic decision making function but what i mean to say is that you have the formulation where you have an example and against each example you have an answer so this can this is a model which can be trained let's say and uh, yeah so statistical functions may or may not be trained um yeah we have to look look that up but for sure like this this formulation can be fed into any sort of machine learning system 
So now that being said, we are at a position where we can quickly drop into uh, like, you know, the human activity recognition problem and what is the central question against that human activity recognition problem. So for most of the human activity recognition problems in the literature out there, what they try to answer is what, was, what activity was the user performing in a given interval of time. And uh, we can have two sort of inputs in that. We can have the sensor uh, data from the wearable device, which can be accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer and stuff, uh, stuff like that. So essentially it is, it is a bit different, uh, like, you know, so you can have videos and audios as well. But when you're talking about wearable, uh, like sensors, you are like, it does not make sense because you are recording uh, like you know video from the wearable device because you cannot really capture the user who is performing the activity whether you will capture something uh, like you know different so what is more common is to use wearable sensors when we are talking about uh, like you know sensor based human activity recognition so we have two inputs the first input is the sensor data from the wearable device and the second input is the interval of time for which the question is asked i mean like this particular question so what were you doing in the last 50 50 milliseconds what were you doing in the last second or something like that and what we expect as an output is a particular activity and these activities can be a range of different activities turning from running walking jogging playing football or whatever sporting activity that you can think of or even like activities of daily life such as um, like you know drinking coffee uh, like you know walking around the house opening the refrigerator now there are a range of different data sets uh, with different type of activities and each of these data sets are kind of focused in some sort of uh, problem so some can be like an you know, athletic data set where you are trying to classify uh, running walking jogging etc some can be um, activities of daily life where you are trying to uh, understand what the person was performing in in his or her daily life etc so there are there can be a range of activities that's the that's what i wanted to say and now coming to the how the classific time series classification of human activity recognition looks like and when I'm saying time series classification now I'm being a bit specific and, and I'm just mean uh, let's say sensor based data and not audio visual sensor but rather let's say uh, accelerometer gyroscope and sensors like that so we have a uh, sensor sensory data coming from wearable device and this essentially is a time series data which looks like some sort of like you know time graph frequency as probably have studied during your high school or your bachelor's so uh, some sort of like you know time uh, sine curve cos curve or something like that similarly this is a time series graph of course it's not as regular as the examples that have given but generally you can think of this some sort of like you know varying graph over the time so what we do is we can approach this problem in two ways which i have said before and this is why i wanted to draw a line between the machine learning and the deep learning systems but once again, I kind of re-specified that this line is not hard and there can be philosophical discussions around how they are different. But for now, let's just assume they're different. For the standard machine learning systems, there has to be like, you know, a step or there can be a step of manual feature extraction where based on this particular inputs that we receive, we try to extract certain features from them. You can, as I have now, this is where I'm contracting a bit, bit myself a bit because I say like this particular matrix, the one that we formulated from the raw time series data, are the simple like you know are, are simply uh, can be simply fed into a single model, and I still stick to that. But what I'm saying is, for each of this row of data, you can also extract additional features or let's say new features altogether, and you can actually feed those features into your system and that's the standard practice for many machine learning uh, like you know most of the many machine learning models such as SVM decision tree logistic regression Gaussian mixture models and even to some extent artificial neural networks the other route that you can take is you do not do like you know this manual feature extraction that I just mentioned but rather you simply feed the whole raw data and the labels together for training into these deep learning features and why I wanted to have a difference between the machine learning and the deep learning system is because there is a manual feature extraction step that I just mentioned for this machine learning system. But for deep learning, when you feed the raw data, the models are so uh, like designed or the models are such, uh, let's say, uh, scoped that it can automatically extract the features on the run dynamically 
and give you an output or a classification result same as the machine learning models to the classification part is kind of the same which helps you classify the different activities so this is the whole uh, like pipeline of the process and now i want to come to the standard machine learning part just to be a bit uh, like you know uh, re specific or refresh what we were saying so this was the input that we have this is the raw input data and we of course have the associated labels with it and for each of this row we extract we can extract certain global features and this is now when i'm saying uh, I'm seeing the standard approach you can of course think of and that is what research is about so there are some standard global features for each of the temporal sequence that has been extracted and used for uh, to be fed into a machine learning system but you are most welcome if you can think of like you know even more intelligent feature extraction procedure apart from the ones that are already there in the state of the art and get excellent results and that would be a very good research addition in a way so basically what you can do is for each row of the data you can extract certain standard global features and this each of the row we call a temporal sequence because this is kind of a sequence that is extracted from a time series data so we extract global features from the temporal sequence and these global features are for example the mean value of this row the median of this row the mode of this row and there can be other metrics such as uh, frequency domain feature coming from uh, Fourier transformation such also there can be certain time domain features there is a particular paper uh, it's a very popular paper I, I just uh, I forgot to include the link in the presentation but they have extracted 512 features from this particular row no, not this particular row. I mean like just imagine uh, just uh, just a disclaimer this is like for this example this is a1 a2 a3 but it it does not need to be till a3 it can be till a n which can be like 200 500 or something like that but the standard practice is not to go till 500 but maybe for this particular problem for for mostly maximum for and, and this again varies for different data sets so what they did was for each of the row of the data which was uh, 256 for them like a1 a2 a3 till a256 they extracted 512 different kind of features from each row of data and so essentially they have uh, converted this like you know matrix into a 500 like when i say this i mean 256 matrix into a 512 uh, cross the number of data points that you can you have matrix and fade those to uh i think a random forest uh, classification like you know a random forest classifier model and they achieved uh, very nice results and it was it, but this was like in i think 2011 or 12 which is i would say uh, pretty old but they achieved excellent results uh, for that matter that is and they have a very good number of citations so i'm pretty sure you can find uh, this particular paper very easily when you uh, do a google search on uh, on this topic but uh, what generally is the algorithm is that we simply feed each of the each row of this temporal matrix now when when we say each of these are temporal sequence we can simply say this whole uh, matrix is a temporal matrix so what we do is we feed each of this uh, row of the temporal matrix and then we extract features for every row and that's it so the new matrix is what we feed into the machine learning system so what we have is the following formulation which i was saying you have like n rows which represent the number of data points that you have extracted from the raw time series data and you have like n features which was 512 for the paper i was talking and then you have labels which is already extracted from the raw series for each of the row and this is what you feed to your machine learning like you know classifier i have just given an example of svm but it can be anything and what additionally you do is you, you actually for a standard as many of you probably know that for a standard machine learning problem we have like you know divide this whole data set like the one that we have historical data that we have received in three parts training validation and testing and this is what we do for like you know uh, for fairness of the modeling procedure so what we do is we extract a set of this data from called training data and then we train our SVM just on the training data and for a small subset of this particular full data set we use this for validation whether like you know the training that we are doing on the model and once the model is trained whether it provides us with let's say reliable predictions or not and then we have a totally unseen data set which is we are emulating a live situation because imagine in a live situation you do not have answers to the question but for this you have answers to the question which is which is which is in terms of the levels but for a real situation you do not have answers to your uh, question so this testing data set essentially emulates the real scenario where we of course we know the answer to the question but the model does not so we use this particular set for testing our uh, like you know our machine learning system and 
the answers how we, how it is used the answers coming out of this particular model for this unseen data is compared against the levels of the unseen data and that helps us understand how many times you are correct and how many times you are wrong and we can figure out the accuracy of this whole uh, modeling procedure in that way so that's why we kind of have this split but yeah just uh, if you think of like you know as a problem then this is the data and this is the modeling and we simply feed the the data to the model to train it and then uh, we can deploy this particular model in a live production scenario and get our predictions uh, on the fly so now i will talk about the second approach and i have already mentioned that instead of doing this manual feature extraction step that we have for a standard machine learning per se we can simply feed this data into the into a deep learning algorithm which can be which is usually now at least the standard now is convolution neural network and recurrent neural network and so the mechanisms inside this neural networks it says that they can ingest this data and transform this raw data into something useful which helps them doing the final prediction and similarly as we have seen in the earlier case we can actually split it into three parts and use it for uh, like you know our modeling and our testing and our uh, like fairness purposes now just uh, like this is this is what i had to generally say about the problem and how it is approached right now now i just want to quickly mention about a uh, certain uh, like you know research applications or certain uh, let's say uses of this uh, like or, or, or i would say how we can how, those who want to do research how they can actually do research on this so as i was saying like one particular uh, area could be that you devise a very clever like new feature from this like in in as in this matrix and then you use it uh, like you know in a machine learning system such as SVM or a random forest which would be which would give you like the answers to the question and this process is a can be a very uh, like you know lightweight process because these algorithms are generally lighter than the deep learning algorithms so that's 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 one like you know route if, if you want to do with work with the modeling part as they work this is one route then if you think about the modeling of the deep learning systems and there are like the convolutional neural networks and the re recurrent neural networks which perform the best you can investigate on why they perform the best and then you can probably come up with even a smarter technique of combining these neural networks or a newer version of these neural networks and use them like you know in your uh, with your raw data and improve the existing state of the art so this can be like for example the the two ways you can actually explore this field but of course they like when it comes to research there are so many wide like you know areas and ranges that you can uh, work with uh, it, it it entirely depends on what what's uh, like you know what you want to do so there is a range of literature out there which you can look up like when you just go to google scholar and do human activity recognition with variable senses you will find a huge load of papers and you can uh, like scheme through them find the best ones and formulate your research problem which is a which is a standard thing for researchers now coming to the engineering part of the applications i was actually working with uh, one very practical application of this problem when i was uh, working with a company so what we used to do is like based on a wearable sensor belt we used to like, you know provide some uh, coaching feedback for runners and one vital step in the process was like you know understanding the activity that the uh, like the, you know the athlete was performing maybe the athlete was running maybe the athlete was jogging or maybe he or she simply stop for a break so what sent what is central for like you know providing the coaching is before you even you can do the live coaching you must understand what the activity that that is performing so basically there is a activity recognition algorithm that is deployed within the process and that has been trained and uh, with some data and that is kind of deployed in this whole pipeline and it helps you like you know that's that's an intermediate step before you can actually provide the live coaching so this is a very practical example from my own uh, like you know field of work apart from that you can think of many other applications so for example in um, in elderly homes they have like a fall detection algorithm that that usually work with sensor data or or even like audio visual data that help that that can that can send an alert to the that can send an alert to the nurse or the monitoring person in the if if an elder person has fall fell fell down or not so basically this is another practical application and apart from that you can uh, in, in in medical domains uh, human activity recognition is widely used and uh, like you know deployed for many applications so basically 
this this is kind of the practical and the research side of it that now being said i'll also give a very small uh, like you know teaser on why let's say i'm just talking here about recurrent neural network and why recurrent neural network can work directly with the process because the internal structure of recurrent neural net network makes the parsing of the time series data easier imagine like you know in this scenario what you have is a temporal sequence which is a1 a2 a3 etc and how a recurrent neural network is kind of organized is that you have different cells and each of these cells kind of take an input x0 x1 x2 up till xt for one particular example or one training example is x0 x1 up till xt is what we see as a temporal sequence a1 a2 a3 up till at and as you can see the recurrent neural network is so designed that there is a connection between each of the internal cells of recurrent neural network and that helps say, propagating the information or the temporal information to be specific across the different cells of the recurrent neural network and this internal structure helps propagate the information of the time series data through the recurrent neural network which is a property that you don't find in uh, let's say standard machine learning systems or uh, artificial neural network for that matter and even for uh, like you know convolutional neural network so basically this structure has an advantage for the recurrent neural networks to uh, ingest time series data and help the processing of the time series data in a smarter in more efficient way so i would really encourage you to look at this particular blog of chris ola from where this recurrent neural network diagram has been taken and because this blog is so nicely written and uh, understandable that you can actually once you like you know and for those who are interested in the deep learning aspect of it of course that if you look at this particular uh, blog you can get like you know wide range of ideas of on how you can use a time series data i will not now restrict myself to human activity recognition but rather to general time series data in a recurrent neural network and use it for your uh, like you know own, your own problem so have a look at this. this is a very nice blog and most of the blogs from chris ola are really nice uh, then the final question of how we evaluate which i have already touched upon a little bit so during our evaluation what we what we have is like now we have a function f which is kind of let's say our trained model and what we provide it is an input and we what we get is an output and as i've told you before that we kind of set out set aside a, a testing data set which we, if we treat as a totally unseen data and then what we do is once we have trained the model along with the training and the val so validation one primary thing that i want to mention is the validation uh, set is different from test te test set in a sense that the test set is not touched until the whole modeling procedure is completed but the validation set can be touched among different like in between so basically you can use the validation data set not for training but for uh, understanding how the training process evolves so let's say in your training process you have uh, like you have trained the whole data set. and and mind you that you have since this is not data deep learning and machine learning uh, like you know lecture i'm not really specifying on how or uh, like you know talking about how the training process evolves or stuff like that but usually what happens is you have let's say 10 n number of examples you use this n number of examples to train the model like let's say a lot of times which is called like you know the number of epochs so let's say 100 epochs so you use a whole data set the whole training data set and train your model 100 times because that's how it learns it looks at the examples over and over again and then modify the parameters of this function and uh, and understand these parameters or uh, modify the parameters of the function and in the final epoch the the goal is that in the final epoch it learns the best parameters or it has the best parameters so basically and this is an evolving procedure so in the when when we say about the validation data set it is imperative that this validation data set can be used in between these epochs and that's how it exactly is so what is the how 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 is the training happening or how, how what is the like the classification matrix that we are getting at the first epoch the classification matrix we are getting in the second epoch and so on and so forth and this continues till the uh, like the n the 100, 100 epoch however for the test data set we kind of use it as a total unseen data set to emulate a real situation so once this whole epoch training is completed with the training data set and validated with the validation data set we bring the test data set into picture and then uh, we feed the test data set input and we get an output but since we know the answer of this uh, like the test data set we can actually verify it with the real answer to check whether it's correct or not and in this way we can uh, s calculate the accuracy of the process and there are other classification matrix as well and this is also an area of research like you know designing classification matrix and uh, stuff like that for this particular problem 
So, uh, one of my colleagues, Thomas, is out. I, I think he, he has made a nice video on, uh, like, you know, matrix for um, classification, and you can actually go to the video and uh, get a more and deeper understanding on how exactly this works. But in general, you can evaluate any sort of classification problem, not really human activity recognition in this way. And uh, yeah, so with that, I would like to uh, bring the discussion to an end. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any uh, questions or comments, you can actually uh, like you know ask directly in the in, in the comments of the YouTube link. And I hope uh, this will be useful for uh, many of you. And thank you for your attention. With that, I would like to say goodbye.